Hi everyone. Welcome back to part two in our series on vectors and matrices in climate mathematics theory and applications. In this section, we'll go over operations performed on vectors and in addition, editing and organizing vectors. Let's first review our two primary vectors we're going to be using. These were discussed in the previous section, so please feel free to go back to the previous video if you need a refresher. But just so we can see it all, here are the elements of my vec. It is a 10 object or 10 element vector. And these are obviously column vectors. And my vec2 is also similarly a 10 element column vector. My vec increments by 1 from 1 to 10, and my vec2 increments by 2 from 1 to 19. So they're of equivalent length. And the only thing that's different is that they increment by diff different factors. We'll kick off this section by going over a basic operation that transforms or changes the elements of an existing vector. We'll call our resultant vector add1. And what we're going to be doing is adding one to each element of our column vector, my vec. So we'll run that and print it out in the console. And here we have it. So my vec originally had a series of numbers from 1 to 10 incrementing by 1. When we add 1, we have 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 1 is 4, and so forth. So what we did was an element-wise operation that added 1 to each existing element, and we were able to derive a new vector from that. Similarly, let's next multiply all the elements of our vector by a scalar of 2. We'll call the resultant vector mult2, and we specify my vec times 2. Run that in the console. And here we have original my vec. When we multiply each element by a scalar of 2, 1 times 2 is 2, 2 times 2 is 4, 3 times 2 is 6, and it goes on. And keep in mind, each of these operations preserves the length of the vector. It does nothing to change the length of the vector. It only changes the existing elements within the vector. Now let's divide each element by a scalar of 2, or equivalently, multiplying by a scalar of 1 half, a fraction. We'll call this resultant vector div2, and we can do it using the slash approach, dividing each element by 2, or equivalently, like what was said earlier, multiplying by a fraction of 1 half. Both ways will give you the same answer, as we can see here, looking back at my vec. 1 divided by 2 is 1 half, 2 divided by 2 is 1, 3 divided by 2 is 1, and 1 half, and it goes on. After performing scalar operations on our vectors, now let's multiply two vectors with one another to find a resultant product vector. We'll call our newly created vector product, and what we're going to do is multiply my vec with my vec2. In essence, we're multiplying each pair of elements. So we're multiplying the row of my vec1 with the row 1 of my vec2. Same thing goes for each of the 10 rows of each respective vector. So let's run that. And we'll view it. And here we can see we still have the same length. The only thing that's different are our elements. We multiplied the first row of my vec with the first row of my vec2 to get this product here, the second row of my vec with the second row of my vec2 to get 6 as the product, and it goes down for each of the 10 elements of our resultant vector product. And we'll just check, is this a vector? And the logical check returns true. And just as a reminder, multiplying vectors requires that each vector be of the same length. The dot product. So instead of getting out a resultant vector, the dot product reduces a vector, or reduces the multiplication of two vectors to a scalar. All right, and this is equivalently called inner product as well. But by multiplying two vectors of the same length together, we can output a scalar, and we're going to see how to do that. So we'll call our scalar dot product, 
and we will use the dot product um, operation which is percent asterisk percent on our two vectors and we'll check the class of dot product in this case it's a matrix but we're going to see exactly what type of matrix it is it's a one by one matrix so when it's a one by one matrix we can easily use coercion all right we'll go back to dot product and we'll use coercion to force it to become a numeric object so we run that we use the function as dot numeric to force this matrix this one by one matrix to become a numeric object and after doing that we'll check the class of dot product and so we can all see it we will print that out in the console and we were able to course this from a one by one matrix to a simple numeric object some of you might be familiar with vector and matrix transpositions it's essentially where we transform the rows to become columns and the columns to become rows so it's a way for us to manipulate and view our data or our data structure in a different way it can also help us perform operations if we're doing it by hand so in this case we will call our um, newly manipulated or newly sorted vector t my vec and we're going to call the t function the t function simply transposes it and we had originally 10 rows in one column and now we're going to have one row and 10 columns a classic vector transposition and when we get to matrices in the subsequent sections we'll see that it does the same task there and another easy function that is useful uh, is the length function the length function will print how many elements you have within a vector so we'll specify length and we want to check the length of my vec and here we have 10 so since it's a vector it's going to have 10 row positions or 10 observations in this section we're going to be editing and organizing pre-existing vectors we can overwrite elements of a pre-existing vector by using the square bracket notation so using my vec we're going to change the element in the third row position and assign to that position 5 so let's run that and view it and unlike our previous iterations of my vec which is a sequence of numbers from 1 to 10 incrementing by 1 in the third position we changed its value from 3 to 5 and we were able to overwrite our existing vector of my vec and overwrite it with this new value assigned to the third position so the square brackets are the elements location it's also called the index of a vector similar notation will be used for matrices and since an element contains one column and n number of rows we only need to specify the row number keep in mind this is for a column vector it will change for a row vector in which we have to specify the number of columns but the notation is just the same since a vector is a number of n rows or n columns with one row or one column for its dimensions now let's change multiple elements so using my vec and we'll call it through the c function let's change the values associated with row 1 row 2 row 3 and row 4 and we'll assign to those rows respectively the values of 20 15 10 and 5 in viewing that we see that the overwrite of our vector was successful and we did indeed change the values of row 1, row 2, row 3, and row 4 so now let's say that we want to delete or remove elements from our vector we're going to use the negative sign so let's remove the first and third observations again we're going to overwrite our vector so we assign to it the operation we're going to perform and we're going to remove using the C function since we use the C function to specify multiple things we want to do and with this negative parameter 
we're going to remove rows 1 and 3. Let's view that. And rows 1 and 3 are no longer there. And even though they show up here, the vector has been renumbered. Its row names have been renumbered to um, make it a nice sequence. But let's check the length of our vector. So no longer is our length 10, but since we removed two rows from our column vector, it now has a length of 8. Sorting a vector can be done in ascending or descending fashion. What I'm doing is I'm overwriting my vec, and I'm using the sort function, specifying the vector I want to sort, and the order in which I want to sort it. Since I specified the option decreasing equals true, this vector will be sorted in descending fashion. So we can see that. Let's run it and view it. So here we have our highest value, 15, and our lowest value, 5. This was sorted in descending order. None of our element values changed, but the order in which they appeared did change. Now let's say that we want to sort this in ascending order. Using the same data set, we specify the option decreasing equals false. So obviously if we're not decreasing, we're increasing, and we're going to sort this in ascending order. Viewing that, we've merely flipped it from the descending order, and now we're increasing from 5 to 15. And finally, to conclude this section, we're going to review how to subset vectors. So extracting specific elements from a vector can be done through subsetting. In this case, we're going to extract the first five elements followed by the seventh element from my vec. In doing this, we will leave out the sixth element, and we're going to create a new subvector called subset. We specify the rows we want using the C function for rows 1 to 5 and 7. Running that and viewing it, we see that subset is only has a length of six values or six observations, and it contains the values from rows one to five and seven of our original vector myvec. In the next section, we'll be going over matrices, matrix operations, matrix manipulations in a way to better understand how data is handled, numeric data is handled, and we'll see you soon. Thanks again.